Well, good morning. It's so good to see you. Hey, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, good morning. I'm so glad you're here. Well, I am glad that you're here today. Uh, happy fourth to you and your family. Um, whatever your plans are today, the freedom we experience today is but a shadow of the eternal freedom that we have in Christ. Uh, we have eternal freedom in Him. And, and so we're uh, excited. So if you would uh, open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, that we're going to continue um, our series in Ephesians. We're, we're getting close. We're, we're on the home stretch. We are now rounding third, and we are coming home. So we're close. We're close. And, and, and I'm so thankful that we've been able to journey through this book together, and I hope that it's put an impression on your heart. Uh, but two weeks ago, I kind of want to catch you up to speed because last week was the Lord's Supper, and man, what a, what a day it was. Um, and I'm so thankful for uh, those two weeks ago and, and baptizing my son. I mean, just I'll never forget that day. Well, we took the Lord's Supper, so we kind of jumped out of Ephesians. So, so let me catch you up to where we were. We, we finished chapter 4 where Paul talks about living in the new self, putting on the new clothes that we have in Christ. And remember, these new clothes is not something that you wear to earn righteousness before Christ. It's something that he's given to you in Christ. You see, we, we are beloved, we're going to find out today, we are beloved children, not because of what we do, but because of what God's Son did for us. And so we put on new clothes. The old lifestyle, you in your darkness of your sin, does not fit someone in Christ. You have a new identity. You have a new lifestyle. You get a new, new style, Mark. New lifestyle, right? The old clothes, they don't fit good. They don't look good on you anymore. And so Paul says, now, now live in your new identity that's given to you in Christ. See, our identity in Christ is not something we earn. It's something that's been given to us. And so we, we live in light of that. Uh, you know, this, this past week we were having supper as a family. And uh, one of the things that we do periodically is we like to grill steaks. But, you know, when I was a kid, you know, grilling, when we knew it was steak night, we got tube steak. While, you know, the adults got steak, you know, the tube steak, if you don't know what that is, it's hot dog, right? And, uh, you know, they would just cut it up and be like, here, enjoy your steak. Um, but no, my kids, they know the difference. They have very expensive palates. You ask them what their favorite food is, all three of them will say steak. And partially that's my fault. I, I, have, I have done that to them. But the other night we were grilling up steaks and we were making their plates and I said, who wants a Caesar salad? Who wants a Caesar salad? And, uh, all, you know, Jace, he's, he doesn't like anything green, right? Um, he's not a rabbit, so he doesn't eat anything green. And, and so he just, he really just, anything green is not going to eat it. So I knew automatically he wasn't going to want a salad. Eli said, hey, I'd like a salad. Emma said, hey, I'd like a Caesar salad, but hold the Caesar, please. <laughs> Honey, I don't think you know what a Caesar salad is. <laughs> the Caesar dressing is what makes the Caesar salad. So you want lettuce, croutons, and Parmesan cheese. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. Listen, we, 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 can't have the, we can't have heaven and hold holiness. That's what Paul is going to tell us today. That they complement one another. That we, we dress for where we're going, not for where we are. And he's going to talk about how we need to walk in certain ways as Christians. We, we walk. We, today's uh, sermon title is Walk the Walk. You know, it's easy to say the things... But it's a, lot, it's a different story to live it out in your life. And so today is where the rubber really meets the road for us as believers. And we're either going to walk out of these doors saying, I know Christ, I am his child, he has given me a new identity, or we're going to walk out still assuming something because our life doesn't match up with what we say we believe. You see, Paul, did, he, he wanted to leave no doubt in the believer, no doubt in our life. He wanted us to know. And so he gave us ways to do that. And he gave us the way that we live our life to know. And so today's passage in Ephesians 5, I want us to know before we get started, it's a, um, it's a pretty heavy passage. Paul does not hold back. He doesn't, he's not holding back. As I was studying, I told Phil, I said, man, I feel like I'm in a scene of the Rocky movie. You know, I feel like Paul is just giving me a left-right combination you know that scene in the Rocky movie where he's talking to his son and he said, son, it's not about how many times you get knocked down, but it's about the times you get picked up. And I'm like, man, I feel like I'm in this scene of Rocky, left, right, 
But the gospel is still here to pick us up. Okay, The gospel is still going to be seen through Ephesians 5, but Paul is not holding anything back for us as believers. You know, I read an article the other day that says, want to be healthier? Change your taste buds. It's only if it was that easy, right? Well, just change your taste buds, he says. The author, he, he begins to say that our taste buds can change once we remove certain food types from our diet, right? We remove sugary and salty food for a while, and eventually it can cause the desires for those unhealthy foods to leave. Well, I still like Krispy Kreme. I mean, I'm still waiting. I still like Bluebell. I'm still waiting for that to leave my taste buds. I don't ever think it will. But Paul's going to say, in a sense, the things that we stay away from and desire more of Christ. So the things that we stay away from and we see that there's, there's no use for them in this new life. I have no use for that. Those sinful behaviors. That doesn't look good on me anymore. And then the longer you begin to stay away from those things and pursue Christ, you realize that, man, true joy is really found in Christ. That you let what Paul's going to say today, his word expose the darkness and you see it for what it really is. So I hope today that you leave here with, a, with an understanding and you let the Word of God expose the darkness and you're able to see for what it really is. You see, our world, it's just temporary pleasures. It's not going to last forever. And so Paul's going to say, but we, we, we pursue a walk that honors Christ. Okay, and so in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 1, we're going to go all the way down to verse 17. He says, therefore, be imitators of God, or some versions say, be imitators of your Father, as dearly loved children. Verse 2 says, and walk in love as Christ also loved us, and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and impurity or greed should never be heard among you, as pr is proper for the saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks, he says. Verse 5, for know and recognize this. See, this is where it gets heavy, and it probably makes a little, uh, some of us a little uncomfortable for what Paul says. Paul says in verse 5, for know and recognize this. He says, please do not miss this truth. Every sexual, sexual immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these partners. For you were, y'all say were, were. He says you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes it, everything visible is light. Therefore it says, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Verse 15, pay careful attention then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of every time, because the days are evil. It's kind of like Paul knew when we were going to live, right? The days were evil in Ephesus, and I think they are evil today. So don't be foolish, he says in verse 17, but understand what the Lord's will is. See, the burden that I feel today is, is to allow... See, that's the thing about preaching through a book of the Bible. You don't get to skip things that make us uncomfortable. But my goal today is to speak the truth in love. Here's why. Because as believers, we love truth. We love truth. We love the truth of God's Word. But we also love people. Truth matters, and people are important. And so here's, here's where I want to juggle today, is I want to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. The Bible says Jesus was full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. You have to have a balance of both. Someone once says, if you're, if you're all grace, then you're condoning. But if you're all truth, you're condemning. So you have to have both. And I believe Paul is balancing both here, but he doesn't hold back. He doesn't hold back because he believes that hell is a real place. And he doesn't want anybody to go there. And so the only way that would keep somebody out 
of hell and not in the kingdom of God would be God's truth, right? And so as Christians, we, we love God's truth. We love his word, even, even the things that make us a little uncomfortable. We don't really understand, but it's still God's truth. But we speak the truth in love because truth is important and people matter. And so Paul, he unpacks some things for us here. You see, Paul is urging the believers to flee in pure sinful behavior through a change of desire and a grateful heart towards God the Father. You see, today, what I want you to leave with understanding is believers, you and me, were called to imitate God by walking in love, light, and wisdom. Walking in love, light, and wisdom. What did Paul say in Ephesians 5.1? He starts it off this way. He says, you have someone that your life should be imitating. You have someone to where your life should look like. And he said, that's, your, that's God. He said, that's your, that's your father. He says in verse 1, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God, as God, as dearly loved children. You see, as beloved children. I love that. He says beloved children. Because why? Because you are beloved in the Father. He didn't say not in order to become a beloved child, but because you have been made a beloved child. You see, the reality is religion will teach you that if you keep God's law, you'll become a child of God. There's lots of religions out there that will say, if you do this, then God will love you. If you do this, then he'll make you his child. But see, Christian is like no other, Christianity is like no other religion where it reverses that truth. You see, Christianity tells us that we were made a child by an act of God's grace and as a gift. And now we should want to imitate him because we love him. We love him. Bless his heart, Eli looks and acts just like me. He can't help it. But you know what I've seen in him is he looks up to me. And I can see how he has started to imitate me in some things. And then I begin to think I really should... <laughs> Watch how I live in front of him, right? Why would he want to do that? Because Eli loves his father. He looks up to his father, and, and Paul is saying, look, because we love God, because he has done something for us as our father that we could never earn in a million lifetimes, we could never make ourselves right before God, and so Jesus, God knew that. So he sent his son who is righteous, and, and the righteous died in the for the unrighteous. And so now God can call us a beloved child because of what Jesus did in, in your place and my place. You're a beloved child. He, he loves you. He loves you. Beloved children, he says. Imitate your Father who is in heaven. So he gives us three ways that we should be imitators of our Heavenly Father. Because why? Because we love Him. We, we want to be like our Father. Right? He's changed us from the inside, and so we, we want to be like him. We want to imitate him in every way. And so Paul gives us three ways that we, can, that we should walk to be imitators of our Heavenly Father. The first thing, if we want to imitate God and, and, and live in this new lifestyle, right? the first thing we have to do is we have to, he says, walk in love. Walk in love. What does he say? He says in verse 2, he says, And walk in love as, as Christ also loved us. And gave himself for us. A sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. He says, walk in love as Christ also loved us. What is he saying? Paul began with walking in love because it's the foundation of the Christian life. It's the foundation of our life as a Christian to, be, to love. You read 1 Corinthians 13, what does it say? It's all about what love is. And he says, if I do all these great things, if I, if I give to the poor, if I even sacrifice my own body, he says, but I don't have love. He says, I am nothing. You see, we're saved by God's love, and we extend that love to others. And so Paul says, if you're going to imitate your father, the first thing you have to do is walk in love. I love how Paul uses walk in all three of these. Walk, it means we're going in a direction. This is who we are. This is how we walk. We, we walk on the beat of a different drum as a believer. And so what do we do? We walk in love. But Paul didn't just give us, he didn't leave us wondering with what type of love we're to walk in. He gave us a type of love. He, he set the standard for love. You see, we, in our culture, I mean, love has got so many definitions for us. People define love in so many different ways. But see, the Bible defines it one way, sacrificial. Sacrificial. And we see that in Jesus. So Paul said what? He said, 
walk in love, but he says there's a standard, though, of love. He sees it, and that standard is Jesus, he says. He says, walk in love as Christ has loved you. Christ has loved you. You see, 1 John says that we don't just love in our words. He says we love in our deeds and action. God took on human flesh and lived a life that we should have lived and died in your place. He, he put his, says I love you in action, didn't he? And so walk in love, he says, in the way that Christ has loved you. Christians, we're supposed to love people the way that Christ has loved us. What comes to mind when you think about Christ loving you? We've already said one, sacrificial. Maybe always forgiving Christ's love for you is always forgiving you. It never gives up on you. Never gives up on you. That's the type of love that Paul is getting to when he says that we should walk in love. Listen, let me ask you this question, and I really want you to think about it. How would your life be different if you sought to love others the way God has loved you? How would your life be different if you took what Paul says? He says, as dearly beloved children, imitate your father. Walk in love as Christ has loved you. How would your life be different if you took God at his word and you began to love others as God has loved you? What if you approached your marriage with sacrificial, always forgiving, and never giving up kind of love? What would your marriage look like? What if, what if you approached your relationships and, and people around you with sacrificial, always forgiving and never giving up kind of love? What would our life look like? What would the church of Christ that he gave his life for, what would it look like if we believed that we were saved through sacrificial love and because of that it changed the way that we loved one another? What would God's church look like? Can you imagine that? That if we took God at his word and we began to walk in love. And the reason we can love one another is because Christ has first loved me. And listen, when Christ loved you, he did not love a better version of you. See, I think that's where we, we kind of get hung up a little bit and where that tension is in our life. And, and the people that are hard to love in our life. And we think, man, if you'll just, if you'll just do this one thing, if, if you'll just get your act together and do this better... It, I would be able to love you. But see, that's the opposite of how Christ has found us. You see, Christ did not love a better version of you. He, he loved you right where you were. And he still gave his life for you. What Paul say in Romans 5, 8, he says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did not wait to get our act together to love us, but he loved us despite of all that. And so Paul is saying, walk in love. But here's the deal, though. Could it be that the reason you cannot find it in yourself to sacrificially love someone else is because you have not grasped how God has first loved you? John, 1 John says, we love because God first loved us. You see, God is the standard for our love. We love because He first loved us. And so could it be today that you cannot find it in yourself to sacrificially love somebody else because you have not completely grasped God's love for you? And when I say grasp God's love for you, we think I wasn't that bad when God found me. I wasn't doing this and I wasn't doing that. But if you go back to Ephesians 2, how did Paul describe you before Christ? You were dead in your sin. So I think we got to go back to that. we got to go back to, God, you, you loved me. Someone like me. So God, would you help me to extend that love to other people? And then Paul says, not only do we, is, is Christ the model for our love, that we love as an act of love to God. He says like an Old Testament sacrifice. He said Christ's sacrifice was a pleasing aroma to God. It pleased God. You see, Paul is saying loving other people is like an offering, a sacrifice to God. Sacrificially loving someone else is never wasted. It's never wasted. Never wasted. So when you sacrificially love someone else because of what Christ has did for you, when you're walking your life in love, you sacrificially loving someone else is never wasted. 
even if the other person does not return the favor. It's never wasted. There are still people who, who look at what Christ did and it does not affect them. They literally mock and scoff at it. But, was, but because there, there will be some who don't accept Christ's love, does that mean his life was wasted? That his death on the cross for sinners like you and me, was it wasted? No, it's not wasted because we're here. Because you're here. And so listen, even if it feels like, man, I, this person is just so hard to love. And you know you have people in your life like that. To sacrificially love them. Not because they deserve it, but because of what Christ has did for you. At times it can feel like it's wasted. But can I tell you, it's not wasted. God says it's like a, it's like a sacrifice to him. The person may not be deserving of that type of love, but Jesus sure is because he did it for you first. What if this, what if you saw loving others as first loving God? A sacrifice to him. What if, what if you saw loving others as first loving God? 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. See with what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. So listen, as, as God's child, and you walk in love and you imitate Him, the first place that we walk is we walk in love. There's never a person that we see that is not deserving of Christ's love. And listen, loving, loving other people sacrificially comes in many forms. Maybe loving someone sacrificially, maybe you're putting your relationship on the line. You're, you're willing to sacrifice that relationship because you want to tell them the truth. That's loving somebody too. Is it really loving somebody when we see them living in sin and we don't tell them the truth? Is it that we really love that person or we love their opinion of us? That's sacrificial love too. But it's also really at times laying down our rights for the benefit of somebody else. Sacrificial love. Sacrificial love, he says. Walk in love. The second thing he says that we walk in is we walk in light. Walk in light. He says in verse 8, we're kind of going to go down and then back up, but he says in verse 8, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You see, Paul describes the theme of light and darkness by contrasting the works of darkness and the fruit of light. You see, there's a difference there. He says, you were once darkness. Remember how he says in verse 8, he says, you were once darkness. He does not say that you were walking in darkness. He says, you once were darkness. That before Christ, my identity was dark. I was living in darkness. And you know, when you look in Scripture and, and you see darkness, it's, it's talking about living outside of God because the Bible says what? God is light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so living outside of a relationship with Christ in sin is, according to Scripture, it's living in darkness. And so Paul says, you were once darkness. That's what he says in verse 8. But here's the good news of the gospel. Thank God for the gospel. Because then he says in verse 9, you are light in the Lord. You are light. Not that you're just walking in light, but you are light, he says. So you once were darkness, but because of Christ that took on your darkness, now you, can, you are light, he says. Colossians 1.13 says, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And so you were living in darkness, and Jesus took on your darkness when he, when he died on the cross so that you could be light. You could be light. So Paul is saying your identity has changed because you once were darkness, but now you are light. Paul now says, walk as children of light, he says in chapter 5. Walk as children of light because you are light, he says. You're not darkness no more. You don't walk as children of darkness. You walk as children of light. Why? Because you are light. Your identity has changed. And listen, the fundamental level of what it means to be a disciple is that my identity has changed. 
I am not that same person. I'm a different person. I don't walk in darkness no more. I walk in light. So, so what it means at the root level to be a Christian means I have a different and a new identity. I am new in Christ. The old things, the darkness, who I once was, now has been transformed, and I'm a new creation, and now I am light, and I'm walking as children of light, he says. What is Paul doing? Paul is calling believers to become who they are. He's calling believers to become who they are. Well, he's telling us today, as Christians, become who you are. You were once darkness, but now, because of what Jesus did for you, took on your darkness, now you are light. So walk in the light. Become who you truly are. And so how do we walk in light? Paul says that we do this. It's simple when you think about it, but it's difficult in our human nature. So how do we walk in light? Paul tells us. He says, Paul says walking in the light means exalting God, not idols. If we're going to walk in the light and we're going to walk as children of the light, we need to exalt God. God and not idols. You see, Paul connects immorality, impurity, and greed all together in verses 3 through 5. If you look, 3 through 5, he takes sexual morality, impurity, and all greed. What does he do? He puts them under the same umbrella as idolatry. He clumps them together and he, he, he places them under the same umbrella as idolatry. If you look, chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, that's that's what he says. And so there's four sins that are mentioned here to describe a dark life. The life that Paul says, this is not you anymore. Get as far away from this as you can. Right? He says there's four things. Sexual morality, impurity, greed, and filthy speech. He says those are four things that describe someone living in the darkness. So the first thing he says is sexual morality. You know the Greek word for, for that sexual morality translates for pornea? Where we get our word pornography from? And so sexual immorality, it really just means activity, any activity outside a covenant relationship with, with someone else. Right? So anything outside of marriage, even if it's between consenting adults. So Paul says, flee from that. So this word sexual immorality, it encompasses any sexual sin, like homosexuality, adultery, pornography, etc., any sexual sin. I read an article, and it was very eye-opening. WLOX posted this, and it, he said, in Mississippi, in the whole United States, Mississippi leads the nation in the time viewed at a certain pornography site. We, we, we have led the nation in, in, in this pornography site, the, the, the time viewed, we have led the nation since 2015. In 2014, we were only beat by two seconds. In Mississippi, where we live. So we, we, we see that there's an underlining issue there. And see, pornography is one of those silent killers. We see all the other sexual sins because they're exposed at times, right? But we can go before a screen and nobody will ever know. And see, we want to get up in arms about every other sexual sin, about sex outside of marriage and homosexuality. But as believers, we, we should encompass them all, and pornography is one of them. Jesus said, if, if you lustfully look at someone else that's not your spouse, you're committing adultery in your heart. So it's so easy to raise up arms about homosexuality, sex outside of marriage, fornication, or pornography. We don't really talk, talk a lot about. It's, it's a silent killer, I believe, in our church. Mississippi, we, we lead the nation in that. And we think, man, nobody knows. Can I tell you, if, if you're here and, and you are walking down that road of pornography, no one else may be watching, but God is watching and he sees it. And it grieves his heart. But God loves you right where you are. doesn't love a better version of you. And so Paul says, flee from that. Sexual morality, it, that word encompasses everything. And then the second thing he says is the other sin. It's impurity. Impurity just deals with any type of filth. Any type of filth. Basically, impure is the opposite of pure. Impurity is the opposite of being pure, right? 
And so this is anything that does not produce holiness in your life. If there's anything that that does not produce holiness in your life, we would call it, it's impure. It doesn't, it's not produced, it's not allowing you to walk this new life with Christ. So he says, flee from that. Get away from that. The third thing is greed, he says. Greed is the uncontrollable desire for more. Uncontrolled, desirable for more, right? You see, Paul lumps this in as idolatry. Because greed is about the heart. It's about desiring something more than God. That's what greed is, desiring something more than what God has given you. You're, you're hungry for what God has not given you. You're, you're coveting something else, right? That's what greed is. It's the uncontrolled desire for more and more and more. You're, you're never grateful for what you have. I, I read something the other day, and Timothy Keller was preaching on the seven, uh, the seven deadly sins, and he gets to greed, and his wife looks at him. She says, hey, you know nobody's going to come to going to come to that service because you're preaching on greed. He said, I know. So he preached the sermon and he said, nobody, he says he could tell preaching, nobody was really moved by it. Nobody was really affected, he said, preaching against greed. He said it didn't really push any buttons. He says, and here's why. He says, because he says, I've never, he says, I've been pastoring for over 30, 40 years. He says, I've never had anybody come to me, sit me down and say, pastor, I'm really struggling with greed. I think I love money too much. I think I love stuff more than God. You see, that's why Jesus said, watch out for all greed. Why did they say watch out? Because it's very, very sneaky. Very, very sneaky. Ever seen Mr. T? Very, very sneaky. Greed is very sneaky. It, it creeps in and nobody really thinks I'm a greedy person. I, I, I might love money too much more than God. That, that if I was at a point to where my money was on the table and my relationship with God was on the table, which one would I choose? And listen, if it's your money, then you have a greed problem. You love that more than you love God, and God says that's idolatry. That's idolatry. And then the, sec the third thing is filthy talk. He says, only let what is pleasing to the Lord come out of your mouth. Grace in your heart will lead to grace on your lips. So whatever pleasing to the Lord should be the only thing that comes out of your mouth. Listen, when you're about to say something, ask yourself, would I, would I talk like this? Would I say this? Would I, would I joke like this if I really believe that, I, that the Bible says that I'm going to be judged for every word that I say? What, would I say this if I really believe God's word when he says that every word that comes out of your mouth, you're going to be judged for? Well, I still say it. Will I still say that about that person? Will I still indulge in this gossip? If I really believe that every word that comes out of my mouth is going to be judged by God. And then lastly, he says, all four of those things, listen, this is what Paul is saying, living in the light. He's saying, point the light of the gospel in various spheres of your life. Point the light of the gospel in every area of your life. Don't just go with the flow. Don't just go with the flow. That's the danger that, that, we, that we allow the flow of the culture to, if it feels good, do it. If it's the pride of life, the, the lust of the eyes, then the lust of the flesh, if it looks good, get it. The lust of the flesh, if it feel good, feels good, do it. Listen, that kind of thinking is going with the flow. But Paul says, no, as children of the light, you walk in light and, and you expose, you let the, the light of God expose every corner of your heart. Every corner of your heart. Because going with the flow means I do, remember, what feels right and what culture is allowing at the time. Remember, we, a long time ago, we looked in Jeremiah 17. What did he tell us? He said, you cannot trust your heart. Your heart is very deceitful. So listen, don't just go by your emotions and, and, and the flow. It's, we we got to expose, what does God's word say? we we got to expose the darkness that's within us and let God's word expose it. And listen, I want us to know this. Living in the light does not mean that you live a perfect life. It just means nothing is hidden. Living in the light does not mean you live a perfect life. We will not live a perfect life until we, we stand before Jesus. So in this life, I'm going to strive to live in the life and in the light. What does that mean? Living in the light does not mean you're perfect. It just means nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. Paul says to walk as children of the light means to live before the eyes of God, not hiding anything. 
I don't know why I do this, but I still do it. When you go to the airport and they're checking your bag to the x-ray and then you have to walk through it, I'm sweating bullets. I'm nervous. And you know they're looking at you. And they're try- they got one person, he's just looking at everybody like, who looks suspicious? So I'm saying, don't look suspicious, don't look suspicious. And so I am, I'm scared. I don't know why I don't have nothing to hide. And so I walk through it, I'm like, oh. But sometimes, I remember this one time, we were going to England, and so I walked through, I walked through, and it just went off. And I'm like, what's the problem? And Boo's like, Brandon, calm down. I don't have anything. I'm not, I don't hi- I'm not hiding anything. Because if I am, it's going to expose it, right? Listen, walk as children of the light means I have nothing to hide. I, I want to live my life in the light so much that I'm not afraid to stand before God. He sees everything, and I've allowed him to, to expose his light to every corner of my life. Everything. I have nothing to hide. Somebody asked Charles Spurgeon, one of the, uh, he's called the Prince of Preachers in the 1800s. He was a pastor and a preacher, and man, he, he, was, he was so wise, and he could preach God's word. And, but somebody came up to him, and he said, hey, Mr. Spurgeon, we would like to do a biography on your life. He says, go ahead. He says, you can actually write my life in the sky, because I have nothing to hide. See, that is one of the joys of being a Christian, because you have nothing to hide. We tell the world, I'm not per- living in the light does not mean I'm perfect. It just means nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. There's freedom in living in the light, guys. Listen, the bondage that you feel, you're trying to do both. And can I tell you, it will wreck you. It will cause you want to throw in the towel and say, this is too difficult. The, the reason it's too difficult is because you're, you're trying to live the Christian life that it was never meant to live. See, that's the beauty of, of community. You surround yourself with people. And let's just say you are, you're someone in here and you're struggling with sexual morality. You should have people in your life to where you can go allow God's light to shine on you and say, listen, I'm struggling with pornography. Help me. I want to live in the light. This isn't freedom. I'm tired of hiding. I wake up every day worried that somebody's going to find out or a reputation's going to be exposed. Listen, live in the light. There is freedom in the light. There's freedom. Listen, and, and you may think, man, what's people going to think? No, you should say, what does God think about this? What does God think about me doing this? I want to live in the light. I want to live in freedom. I'm tired of lurking around the corner and wondering, man, is this the day it's going to get exposed? Go to God and say, God, I want to live in the light. I, I allow your light to shine any, anywhere in the corner of my heart. E- every crevice, everything. And so he says, flee from those things and live in the light. You see, the fruit of the light, Paul says, is what? It's in Scripture. He says it's three things. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. When you live in the light, that's the fruit of the light. The result of living in the light is you live in goodness. You live in God's goodness. You have His righteousness And you love truth. You live in truth. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. Verse 4 says, A grateful heart is the way to combat any of these dark sins. He says, says, But have thankfulness in your heart. That's odd, Paul. How is it that I'm going to get rid of sexual morality in my life, impurity, filthy speech, and greed by being grateful? Listen, all four of those sins at the root of it, it's a worship problem. You have dethroned God and you have put yourself on that throne. It's a worship problem. Paul says it's an idol problem. An idol is anything that you put before God. So Paul says the way that you, you smash idols in your life is by being grateful to God. You see, thankfulness says this. If I'm thankful towards God, it says, in God I have all that is good for me. I will not be driven to dishonor the worth of his name. I will not be greedy for something that's not mine. I I will be thankful for what God has given me. You see, gratefulness can smash idols in your life. It can smash the need to think, I need something else other than God. As believers, God should be the most beautiful thing to us, not just useful. Is God beautiful to you or is he just useful? If he's useful, then he's just going to be another idol in in your life. You're just going to fit him in there when it's convenient for you. 
But Paul says, no, the way that you smash the idols in your life is you dethrone them by placing, gre- by placing gratitude, thankfulness. God, I'm th- thank you for what you've given me. God, you have blessed me tremendously. And if I have nothing else in this life, I have the hope of heaven. Then in heaven, I, whew, I'll have everything that I'll need. I'll be with you forever. And all the things that were bad and, and sad here in this life will one day be untrue. Do you believe that you have all you need in God? Well, lastly, he says this. He says, not only do we walk in love, not only do we walk in the light, but we walk in wisdom. Verses 15 through 16 says, Pay careful attention then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish and understand what the Lord's will is. He says, pay careful attention then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And so Paul says, walk in love. Walk in light. Nothing is hidden. I'm not perfect, but nothing's hidden. And I'm walking in wisdom. Psal, uh, the psalmist says this in Psalms 90, 12. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Listen, living this Christian life means that you walk in wisdom. And walking in wisdom means not allowing the immediate and temporary to control your actions and decisions. You be wise. Could this be detriment to me? Could this hurt my family? Could this hurt relationships? Could this hurt God what you're trying to do in my life? Could it damage what you're trying to do? So walking in wisdom means I I cipher everything through God's word and I've allowed what the psalmist says, teach me Lord to number my days. See listen, when you realize that your life is short and one day you'll stand before God, you let that day inform your decisions this day. Because we're not going to live forever. I saw an illustration one time, and there was a long rope, and you couldn't see the end of the rope. It was so long. I was like, I've never seen that long of a rope before. And it was just so long. It just went on forever, and I couldn't, couldn't see the end of it. But on one side of it, he had this little piece of tape on the end of it. It's like this big. And he said, this is your life, and the rest is eternity. I couldn't see the end of it. And man, compared to the rope, that was just a small piece. Listen, that's in light of eternity. That's our life here on earth. It's very short. And so walking in wisdom, when I, as a believer, I, I don't let the immediate and temporary control my actions and my decisions. Walking in wisdom means letting that day. Remember, when you stand before a holy God and form how you live today. Because that day is coming for everybody. I need to let that day inform this day. I need to let that day give me wisdom of speech. I need to let that day inform the decisions that I make. Because Here, it's just temporary. It's just temporary. That day is forever. And see, knowing the days are evil should give us a sense of urgency for our... He said the days are evil. Listen, we don't have to look far to know that days are evil. They're evil in Paul's day, and they're evil today. But listen, that should give us a sense of urgency as a church, shouldn't it? Let me ask you, if, if you know the ship you're on is going down, what should your attitude be? Is it not to make sure people know about the rescue boats? If the ship is going down, what are you going to do? Hey, there's a way out. There's There's a way for salvation. Listen, as believers, we do that. We say, listen, this is going down and it's not going to last forever. But Jesus died in your place. He's the answer. He's the solution. He's the rescue that you need. And so, wisdom... Walking in wisdom. Here's a question you can ask yourself every day. A thousand years from now, will I be glad I lived my life this way? Will I be proud of the way that I lived my life? And so he says, walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. I want to end this way as Phil comes up. I want to go back to verse 5. And I... I want to speak to that tension of what Paul is saying here. You know, when I I walked in Phil's office, I told him, I said, I'm bearing a burden, brother, and and I need you to pray for me. Because this is a heavy passage, and, and Paul doesn't hold anything back. But I wanted to speak the truth because I love you. And, and I want you to know what God's Word says, not what I say. I, who cares what I say? Who cares what I think? What does God's Word say? And if, and if we have come to Christ 
this is the final say in our life. This is it. I, I stand under this authority. This has the final say. And so I said, brother, I have this burden, and I, I wanna, but I want to speak the gospel. I, see, the gospel is the how. Listen, don't listen to these things. Get away from sexual morality, filthy talk, impurity, greed. Don't, don't see that as a way to get into God's kingdom. It's not. It, it, is, it is suicide to try to live my life under the weight of God's law and to try to think, man, I can fulfill it and make God's happy. It, it's like you're killing yourself. You can't do it. You need someone who can, and his name is Jesus. And so don't listen to these things and think, man, I, I just got to do those things so that God will be happy. No, God wants, he provided a way, a way for you to do that, and it's the gospel. That's the how. So if I don't tell you the how, then, man, you're going to leave here defeated and just beat up and weighed down. That's not how I wanted you to leave. So the burden that I bear today is that you hear the pure message of the gospel. Because Paul says in verse 5, he says, For know and recognize this, every sexual immoral or impure or greedy person who is, who is, an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. You see, this passage tells us with uncompromising clarity that repentance from immor immorality and the pursuit of Christ's -like likeness have always conveyed salvation in a believer. He says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Any sexual, immoral, imp impure, I greedy, Filthy speak, those people, he says, will not. But listen, he says, what did he say? He claims it. He says, who is an idolater? Who is? They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. These are people who refuse to repent. They refuse to repent of their life. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And sadly, the Bible tells us in Matthew 7 that they're going to be people that stand before God and their illusion that they had in this life is going to be shattered before a holy God. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. He says you're not, repentance, that, that's the goal. Listen, David, he committed adultery, sexual immorality. But yet at the end of his life, what did God say about David? He said he's a man after God's own heart. What was the difference? The difference was repentance. Read Psalms 51, you see David's repentance, and he is lamenting before a holy God, and he says, God, it was me. I did those things. I was going with the flow. I, I did what felt good in the moment, and I walked in darkness, and so God, forgive me. And so God did not reject David because David repented to God. Repentance. And I believe with a room this big and this many people, there needs to be some repentance. But listen, if you refuse, refuse to give that up, sexual immorality, impurity, filthy speech, and greedy, Paul says, the inheritance of the kingdom, it's not yours yet. It's not yours yet. But there is a way. Jesus made a way. You see, the gospel says this. The gospel says God hates sin enough to kill for it. Do we believe that? That God hates my sin enough to kill for it? But here's the good news of the gospel. God loves you enough to die for you. God hates sin enough to kill for it, but God loves you enough to die in your place. So I don't, I don't know where you find yourself, but I, I want you to hear the grace of God wherever you, you are. You don't know Christ. You, you are a believer, but yet you're being tempted to walk. Would you just allow God to shine his light in your, in your heart and repent of that. Repent of that. Listen, walk the walk. It's easy to say, I'm a Christian. And, and are culturally saturated with Christianity and churches. It's easy. But like I said, one day, there are going to be people who are in church. And their illusion is going to be shattered before a holy God. Because they didn't repent. They refused to give it up. They refused to flee darkness and pursue God who is the light. Would you bow your head just for a moment? I'm going to ask that you would allow God to search your heart and listen, allow him to expose the darkness in your life. And listen, if that's you today and you say, I would not inherit the kingdom of God, I have refused to give this up, I have refused to, to live in the light, 
If that's you, I would ask maybe let today be the day where you, you go from being darkness. Now you're a child of light. Let that be, be you today. So, Father, would you do what only you can do in this moment? God, would you, would your grace be evident here today? God, you, you hate sin enough to die, to kill for it, but you love us enough to die in our place. And so, God, would you do a work here today in Jesus' name? Amen. Church, would you stand? Would you respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Maybe today is the day for your salvation that I'm coming out of darkness and into light.